Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come before you, worshiping your holy name. Lord God, may your spirit work in our hearts. These words that you have prepared, Lord, these words that come from your one true word, our Bible, Father. May these words change our hearts, change our minds, change the way we live our lives, all for your glory. May we, Father, always live our lives appreciating the gifts of your grace that was shown to us through your Son, Jesus, and his death on the cross for our sins. Father, we thank and praise you. In his name we pray. Amen. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be able to come back and preach here again. Um, you guys are getting me all month. I don't know if you're know, well, well aware of that or not, so I hope that's okay. But um, my, my requirements for my internship, much appreciated, so thank you for that part. Um, as we look forward to a new year in 2016, I know one thing that I always do, and I'm sure most of us do any time a new year approaches, we like to look back at last year. I look back at last year, and I actually had some, some good times last year. The only times I can actually remember are the non-blurs of school and internship and work and stuff. And a family trip to Rapid City was a fantastic time. Uh, times that I could spend during recovering from my surgery actually was a pretty good blessing. Um, I got to lay around and watch a lot of TV while my wife served me but didn't get upset about it. It was really great. <laughs> I had actually installed a bell ringing app on my phone but I figured that was pushing it too much so I, I didn't use that one. Um, and another thing I laughed at, and my, my kids and I still laughed at, we had a really great time. We watched the movie Inside Out. It came out this year. I don't know who's seen that movie. Uh, a Disney, a Pixar animation movie. Kind of a, a funny little movie with a unique little twist. Inside Out is about a young tween girl. And of course, she's going through the range of emotions as she's growing up. And, and the whole movie is in a sense about her five emotions. And what the movie plays out is inside your mind is this control panel. And the control panel is run by one of these five emotional characters. Uh, everybody in a sense is run by what's called joy, sadness, fear, anger, and disgust. Um, the main characters in the movie really were joy and sadness. Uh, joy was obviously trying to run everything. The character, main character girl was very happy in it. Um, we did get a kick out of sadness. At one point she said, remember the funny movie where the dog died? Because that was her character. She liked everything to be sad. Uh, there was also the character Fear, who when asked to compile a list of things that could go wrong in the first day of school, he said, all right, I'm, on the letter, I'm already on the category M for Meteor. So, I mean, he's anticipating everything bad is potentially happening. And as we think about the new year and look forward to it, it got me thinking of various ways that we might look at a new year if we evaluate those. I think there's three kind of emotions that might come with a new year. But as much as a year can always change, there's also one thing that's always in common. So whether or not we're approaching 2016 with a sense of sadness, because maybe 2015 wasn't your best year, and maybe 14 wasn't a great year either, and it seems to carry over, and you're not exactly looking for 2016, or maybe 2015 was a really great year, the opposite of sadness, it was a really happy year, and you're just anticipating 2016, knowing that that's going to carry over and you're looking forward to it, or quite possibly there's fear of the unknown. What is 2016 going to look like? So as much as all these emotions can vary, one thing holds true through all of this, and that's God's faithfulness. No matter whether you're scared, happy, sad. God's faithfulness will carry you through this year and every year. And as I was compiling a sermon based on God's faithfulness, as funny as it sounds, it was actually hard to find verses that fit it because, in a sense, the whole Bible is about God's faithfulness. So I figure sitting up here reading from Genesis to Revelation might take a while. I'm sure you wouldn't mind starting off your 2016 in a different fashion and sitting here for a few weeks. So what I did is I actually took a couple different sections out of Scripture that I think highlight God's faithfulness depending on this very emotions that you might feel looking at 2016. And even if you're not the type that cares much about New Year's, I think we definitely all go through that point in life where we just evaluate, we reflect on a previous year, and we wonder what's to come. So if we look at the different scenarios and how God's faithfulness fits in, what about sadness? 
And sadness is a difficult one. If you had a hard 2015, whether it was family issues, if you're not getting along with your spouse, nothing breaks your heart more than kids. If you're struggling with your kids, fighting with siblings, maybe there's financial issues. We've had points, we've had highs, we've had points, we've had lows. Financial issues can really wear on you, especially if it's been a long time, whether it's job searching or you're just living paycheck to paycheck or even if all that's covered but you're miserable at work. Other areas of sadness, inner struggles. You kind of look upon yourself and think to yourself, you know, I'm not living the life I want to live. You're frustrated with life. You feel like you're kind of stuck. Or lastly, even that struggle with sin. You're living a life doing things you know you shouldn't be doing, and it almost feels like it's got that control over you. You want to let it go, but you can't. So we get these issues that can hit us, and after a while, it almost feels like we're in the wilderness. And the Bible describes the 40 years of wilderness the Israelites wandered through. I think we can get that at points in our lives as well. We're kind of stuck somewhere. Is there an end in sight? We want out of the situation we're in, but we don't know when our current situation is going to end. And so then when that sadness kicks in and it affects the last year, maybe the year before, maybe it's been going on for a while, all of a sudden you lose hope and you don't look forward to a new year because you just assume the new year is going to be the exact same as the previous years. This is going to get a little bit lengthy. I do apologize. There is one section I read a lot on. But I think this is important because anybody that is going through that period of sadness and darkness, I want to read from Lamentations 3. Starting at verse 1 all the way to 24. Now it is poetry, so it's a little quicker. But the reason I read all of this is because if you're at that point where there's that heaviness in your life, that sadness, you're going to relate here to Jeremiah, and it's the last part that I want you to focus on. Listen to see if this describes you. I am the man who has seen affliction under the rod of his wrath. He has driven and brought me into darkness without any light. Surely against me he turns his hand again and again the whole day long. He has made my flesh and my skin waste away. He has broken my bones. He has besieged and enveloped me with bitterness and tribulation. He has made me dwell in darkness like the dead of long ago. He has walled me about so that I cannot escape. He has made my chains heavy, though I call and cry for help. He shuts out my prayer. He has blocked my ways with blocks of stone. He has made my paths crooked. He is a bear lying in wait for me, a lion in hiding. He turned aside my steps and tore me to pieces. He has made me desolate. He bent his bow and set me as a target for his arrow. He drove into my kidneys the arrow of his quiver. I have become the laughingstock of all peoples, the object of their taunts all day long. He has filled me with bitterness. He has sated me with wormwood. He has made my teeth grind on gravel and made me cower in ashes. My soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. So I say my endurance has perished. So has my hope from the Lord. Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it and it is bowed down within me. If that kind of pain and sadness sounds like something you've gone through or are experiencing, hear this part now, though. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Jeremiah right there is writing in Lamentations the destruction of Israel, of Jerusalem, sorry, that he's sitting there watching. He has been prophesizing this whole time to Jerusalem to repent. They don't listen. And he's now watched his beloved city destroyed. And he's writing from the anguish and the pain in his heart. If you can feel that type of anguish in your life, you've ever felt that. If you're looking forward to 2016 that way, remember though... The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I want you to understand one thing. Your earthly circumstances should not mask God's faithfulness. 
we can't forget the fact that God is faithful. He sent us a Savior in His Son, Jesus. God is faithful when He promised us a Counselor. We have the Holy Spirit here on this earth drawing us to Him. And God is faithful. He promised us eternal life with no more sorrow and no more tears. So if you're wandering through that wilderness, life is hard and you're tired and you're worn out and you can't do it anymore, God is faithful. And there's more than what you see here. You see, God has never gone back on His Word. And if we look at God's Word throughout Scripture, what He has said and what happens, and if we know one thing about God, it's His character. And His character is love. He loves you, and He cares for you. Your earthly circumstances do not want you to feel that, but God loves and cares for you. It can be hard to remember, but know that He's always true to His Word. And so while things may not get better when we place our, host, uh, place our hope in Christ, things may seem challenging and difficult, what we learn to look at is understanding that through God's faithfulness, everything that He has promised us in His Son, Jesus Christ, does lead to eternal life in a better place. And that should be our hope getting us through those difficult times. Now the opposite of sadness in which we look back on a difficult year and assume next year is going to be the same as happiness. It kind of works the same way. You had a great year in 2015, and you're anticipating a great 2016. What I want to do, though, the one mistake I think that Pixar made in that movie is they called the girl Joy. She should have been named happiness because there's a difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is when our earthly circumstances work in our favor. Something good happens for us. Happiness is comfort, it's peace, it's family, it's prosperity. All these things that we want around us, when they're all going in our favor, that makes us happy. It's the Vikings in the playoffs. Granted, that could change tomorrow morning to sadness, but I'm hanging on to happiness today. And you see, when it comes to happiness, it can all change. Luke 12, 16 to 21. Jesus says this. And he told them a parable saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So this is the one who lays out treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Happiness isn't a bad thing. Wealth is not a bad thing. The problem is when you place your trust in earthly fortunes because there's no assurances that they are going to last. If you had a great year last year, that's awesome, and I pray you have a great year again this year. But there is no assurance that that is going to last. When you are prospering, when you feel that God has blessed you, it's great. You look at Abraham, Joseph, David. They were all immensely blessed by God, but all of them also, more importantly, placed their hope in God above all things. Look at the tale of Solomon. As we know, Solomon lost focus of all that. Solomon got drawn into all of his riches. And read the book of Ecclesiastes if you ever want to hear about his lament. So while you may have earthly successes, I want you to understand this much, though. In John 10.10, 10, Jesus just said this, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. That's the difference. The abundance of life. Everything we have in this earth is going to get old. It's going to fall apart. Maybe we have the resources to, to replace it, and that's great if you do. But it doesn't change the fact you cannot place your hope in anything that is earthly because eventually it's going to let you down and it's going to fail you. Christ never will. What we have to understand, though, is that God's love through His Son was sent out for the whole world. This morning we sat in our Bible study and we talked about it. But the difference with the Israelites, God's plan that they had, and then how that changed to the whole world, and the hope that the whole world was to have in God through His Son, Jesus Christ, through a Savior. God will never leave us. He will never forsake us, unlike our earthly possessions. That right there is our abundance, that assurance of eternity through Christ because God was there for us. So we can appreciate what we have on this earth. 
But that's not where our joy is going to come from. So if you have sadness that makes you dread next year, and you have happiness that makes you look forward to next year, what about fear? Fear is the uncertainty of next year. What does this year hold for us? I want to read again the words that Jesus said in Matthew 6, 25 through 27, and then verse 33. Matthew 6, 25 through 27, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body and what you will put in it. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? In verse 33, Jesus reminds us, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So a new year can be scary, but it's trusting God in that new year. Listen, I'm terrified of 2016. Frankly, I've been dreading it. Every time the calendar changes, I get a little more nervous. Because I've done 20 years of my career in radio. As I've said before, I could walk into any radio station in the country. They could flip me the keys to the car and say, have at it. I know what I'm doing. I graduate school with the Master's Divinity in four months from right now, and I'm supposed to go be a pastor at a church. I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm 42 years old, and as you can tell by today, I have no idea what I'm doing. It's been a rough start to the, to the year for this. And to the point where, in fact, is, you know, we've got communion coming up. This is my first ever communion I've led. I figure if I stall long enough on the sermon, you'll eventually all just go and I won't have to do it, because I'm terrified. <laughs> so, we're starting on volume one of my sermon, all right? I figure by about four this afternoon, it should have cleared out. But I'm a little nervous about doing all of that, because... This is unfamiliar to me. I don't like the unfamiliar. I like where I'm at in life right now. I have a home that I love. My kids are happy where they're at. My family's comfortable. Life is really good right now. I can go into my job and know what I'm doing. And I'm supposed to start new? But I trust God because he's calling me to do it. But it's not easy to trust God. Again, because we don't know what a year has in store for us. Do you know in the beginning of 2015... I made a New Year's resolution to continue working out extra hard. I love playing racquetball. That was great until a couple months later, I went down one time with severe pain, and then the next day at work, the same thing, and I went to the doctor, and now I have a new hip. All right, I wasn't anticipating that. There's a lot of things that we don't anticipate with the new year. We don't know what's happening, and that is a little frightening, but we have to trust God because as I was putting this together, I got thinking about it. Who spoke everything into existence? Existence. Did God not speak it all into existence? I kind of think he knows what he's doing. It's a little hard to trust that because our flesh is like, but I like what I have right now. I actually heard this one time. I thought this was a great assessment. Somebody said, the reason we want to know the future is because really we want to approve God's plan first. You know? Hey God, can you show me and reveal to me your plan? Give me a pen. I don't like this right here. Can we scratch that off? I want this outcome here, and if it could work this way, that'd be great. And then we sign off on it. Here you go, God. Much appreciated. Thanks. It doesn't work that way, though. We can't do things that way, especially because what if there's a point in our life that's a trial? I wouldn't sign off any trials. None of us like that. But that refines us and helps us be who we are. And so that trust then has to come that God knows what he's doing and he cares for us. So with sadness we have the fear of what's to come, assuming it's going to be the worst, but we have to understand that God has he promised us an eternal hope of life forever with no tears and no sorrow. So there is an end. It may not even come on this earth. That would be sad, but there is an end to it. A time when you'll be happy. With happiness, we look at that as joy, knowing that God will never fail us like all earthly things will do. With fear, God has promised us that he has plans for us and that he will take care of us. I think the ultimate definition of God's faithfulness, and the word isn't mentioned there, but if you read what he's saying, it is. Philippians 4, 11 to 13. So many of us have heard Philippians 4, 13 before, but if you get the two verses before it, it absolutely changes its meaning. Paul writes this in Philippians 4, 13. 
16, Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Paul's saying, I don't care what obstacles I face. Good or bad, it doesn't matter. Life is a roller coaster with highs and lows, but Christ is that steady through all of it. And Paul is saying, that's all that matters to me. That's where he draws his strength. So I want you to know this. Our life is not driven by little emotions in our brains. Instead, it's by the hope and assurance we have in a faithful God and the work He completed through His Son, Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we just thank You for the assurances that we have. The most amazing thing, Father, is You are a God that is true to His Word, that we can trust in You, Lord, because everything You have said has come to be. That assurance we have in You, Lord, of knowing we place our hope in Your Son, Jesus Christ, that we can spend an eternity with You, Father, rejoicing and praising You. We pray Your Spirit will continue to fill our hearts and draw us nearer to You. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.